The Problem of the Puer Aternus by Marie Louise von Franz. Lecture 2. Last time we spoke of the boa constrictor which ate up the elephant and how Saint Exupery as a boy made the drawing and was always looking for somebody to understand it but never found anyone. We said that this short introduction foreshadowed the tragic end of the book and of Saint Exupery's life, since there was no lysis. In the hero myth, if the hero is swallowed by the dragon, or the big snake, or the sea monster, or the whale, he has to cut out the heart or the stomach from the inside, or else he dances inside the whale until the monster dies or vomits the hero out. In our story, the hero animal, as we interpreted the elephant as a kind of symbolic anticipation of the hero on the animal level, is swallowed and does not come out again. We can therefore take this introduction, which has no lysis, symbolically as a childhood dream, which would mean that the childhood fantasy of Saint Exupery has no lysis. This shows that there is something basically weak or broken in him from the very beginning. There is something which cannot escape the fatal aspect of the unconscious. Saint Exupery, in a slightly ironical manner, speaks mockingly of the grown-up world and the grown-up people who take themselves so seriously and are really occupied with such trifles. That he himself had such attributes is shown quite clearly in the biographies. General David, one of his military superiors, says of him, quote, He was a man of integrity, with a taste for childish pleasures, which were sometimes surprising, and he had unaccountable fits of shyness when faced with administrative stubbornness. The latter always remained his bete noir. Bete noir is a French term meaning black beast. Other biographies state that he was a little bit disappointing to people who met him because he was a bit of a poser. He gave the impression of always acting and of not being completely genuine. This tendency to go off into surprisingly childish pleasures is not only a symptom of the Puer Aternus problem, but also belongs to the creative personality. Creativeness presupposes a tremendous capacity for being genuine, for letting go, for being spontaneous. For if one cannot be spontaneous, one cannot really be creative. Therefore, most artists and other creative people have a normal and genuine tendency to playfulness. That is also the great relaxation and means of recovery from an exhausting creative effort. Therefore, we cannot ascribe this trait only to St. Exupery's Puer Aternus nature. It might also belong to the fact that he was an artist. The remark made by General David that St. Exupery never overcame his rage over administrative obstinacy, either of the state or the military, and that, on the other hand, he was shy and afraid of those in administrative positions, is important in the connection with the motif of the sheep, which we have now to discuss. To the man in an office, other people are sheep, and as soon as we are faced with somebody in an official position, we become sheep, and he becomes the shepherd. We are just numbers so and so to him, and naturally officials will make one feel like that. It is the modern problem of the overwhelming power of the state and the de-evaluation of the individual, which, on a minor scale, is the problem of every Puer Aternus whenever he has a difficulty adapting. But it is also the problem of our time. The revolt which most people feel at being reduced to the level of a sheep in a flock is not confined to the Puer Aternus for there is something genuine and justifiable in it. Everyone who has not settled that problem within himself, namely how far one has to accept the fact of being just one of a number 
and how much one is an individual with the right to individual treatment. Has this complex reaction against what David describes as military stubbornness? The problem is not only Saint Exuperis, but it is the great problem of the whole Christian civilization. In France, however, it takes a specific turn. For the French, they tend to display exaggerated individualism, a kind of protest against all administration, though lately under de Gaulle there has been some change. Since the First World War there has been a tendency in France to revolt and be negative in connection with everything had to do with the pressure of the state, even to the extent that numbers of people voted for communism, not because they were really communists in their Feltanschung, but simply as demonstration against the existing order. Such people who would proclaim that since they did not like the lawyers and clowns in Paris who constituted the government, they intended to vote communist. This shows a completely infantile attitude toward the problem of social and collective responsibility. It is the attitude which we now see exploding in the behavior of teenagers who challenge the police or overturn rows of cars or do some such things as a protest against collectivity. That, however, is understandable on the part of very young people who explode like this without any reflection. But when grown-ups behave similarly, when they vote for communism simply because they do not like those in the government, that seems very immature. This is a very general complex, and one which we all have in some form. For we have not decided how far we must accept being sheep shepherded by the state, and how far we can reject such collective pressure and revolt against it. The puer aternus naturally has this problem in an even more pronounced form. Before we go into the symbolism of the sheep, we should ask ourselves why Saint Exupery meets the little prince in the desert. In interpreting the story, we have taken the airplane crash as illustrating, in one way, an incident of Saint Exupery's personal life, and, on the other hand, a symbolic or archetypal situation with which every encounter with the unconscious begins, namely the complex breakdown of former activities, the goal in life, and, in some form, the flow of the life energy. Suddenly, everything gets stuck. We are blocked and stuck in a neurotic situation, and in this moment the life energy is dammed up, and then generally breaks through in the revelation of an archetypal image. Last time I quoted the Islamic story of the 18th surah of the Quran, where, after having lost his only nourishment, the fish, Moses took Qadir, Allah's first angel, with him into the desert. It is not inevitable that after such a collapse, a child image would emerge. Any other kind of archetypal figure also might turn up. We will now go into the symbol of the child god. And I want first to read to you what Jung says. I want to subdivide this, the greatest symbol there is in the book, because part of what the little prince really represents only becomes clearer much later when we know more of the story. Now I will only read as a general outline what Jung says about the child god. Jung, this archetype of the child god is extremely widespread and intimately bound up with all the other mythological aspects of the child motif. It is hardly necessary to allude to the still living Christ child, who in the legend of Saint Christopher also has the typical feature of being smaller than small and bigger than big. In folklore, the child motif appears in the guise of the dwarf or the elf as personifications of the hidden forces of nature. To this sphere also belongs the little metal man of late antiquity, who, till far into the Middle Ages, on the one hand inhabited the mine shafts, and on the other represented the alchemical metals, 
above all Mercurius, reborn in perfect form as the hermaphrodite. Thanks to the religious interpretation of the child, a fair amount of evidence has come down to us from the Middle Ages, showing that the child was not merely a traditional figure, but a vision spontaneously experienced, as a so-called eruption of the unconscious. I would mention my Meister Eckhart's vision of the naked boy and the dream of Brother Eustatius. Interesting accounts of these spontaneous experiences are also to be found in English ghost stories, where we read of the vision of a radiant boy said to have been seen in a place where there are Roman remains. This apparition was supposed to be of evil omen. It almost looks as though we are dealing with the figure of the Puer Aeternus who had become inauspicious through metamorphosis, or in other words, had shared the fate of the classical and Germanic gods who have all become bugbears. The mystical character of the experience is also confirmed in part two of Goethe's Faust, where Faust himself is transformed into a boy and admitted into the choir of blessed youths, this being the larval stage of Dr. Marianus. I do not know whether Goethe was referring with this peculiar idea to the cupids on antique gravestones. It is not unthinkable. The figure of the cuculatus points to the hooded, that is, the invisible one, the genius of the departed, who reappears in the childlike frolics of a new life, surrounded by the sea forms of dolphins and tritons. The sea is the favorite symbol for the unconscious, the mother of all that lives, just as the child is in certain circumstances, closely related to the phallus, symbol of the begetter, so it comes up again in the sepulchral phallus, symbol of a renewed begetting. End of quote. The great problem which we are confronted in this general outline by Jung is the double aspect of the child archetype. Just as in one way it means a renewal of life, spontaneity, and a new possibility suddenly appearing within or without and changing the whole life situation in a positive way, so also does the child god have a negative aspect, a destructive one, namely where Jung alludes to the apparitions of a radiant boy and says that this must have to do with a pagan child god who has been condemned to appear only in negative form. The negative child god leads us into very deep waters, but it is safe to say that whenever the child motif appears, we are almost always confronted with the following problem. The child motif, when it turns up, represents a bit of spontaneity, and the great problem, in each case an ethical individual one, is to decide whether it is now an infantile shadow which has to be cut off and repressed, or something creative moving us towards a future possibility of life. The child is always behind and ahead of us. Behind us, it is the infantile shadow which must be sacrificed, that which always pulls us backward into being infantile and dependent, lazy, playful, escaping problems and responsibility and life. On the other hand, if the child appears ahead of us, it means renewal, the possibility of eternal youth, of spontaneity and of new possibilities, the life flow toward the creative future. The great problem is always to make up one's mind in each instance whether it is an infantile impulse which only pulls us backward or an impulse which seems infantile to one's own consciousness but which really should be accepted and lived because it leads us forwards. Sometimes the context of the dreams shows very clearly which is meant. Let us say a Puer Eternus type of man dreams about a little boy. Then we can tell from the story of the dream if the apparition of the child has a fatal effect, in which case I treat it as the infantile shadow still pulling backward. But if the same figure appears positive, 
then you can say that it is something which looks very childish and silly, but which must be accepted because there is a possibility of new life in it. If it were always like that, then the analysis of this kind of problem would be very simple. But unfortunately, like all products of the unconscious, the destructive side and the constructive, the pull backward and the pull forward, are very closely intertwined. Such figures can be very difficult to understand, and sometimes it is practically impossible. That seems to me a part of a fatal situation with which we are confronted in this book and in St. Exupery's problem. For one cannot make up one's mind whether to treat the figure of the little prince as a destructive infantile shadow whose apparition is fatal and announces St. Exupery's death or to treat it as the divine spark of his creative genius. One of our students has evolved the idea that there is something like a defective self that in certain people whose fate is very unfortunate, the symbol of the self appears defective, which would mean that such people have no chance in life, because the nucleus of their psyche is incomplete and defective. So the whole process of individuation cannot develop from this kernel. I do not agree with this idea, because I have never seen such symbols of a defective self without an accompanying defective attitude of the ego. That means that wherever you find such a defective self-symbol, where it is ambiguous and incomplete and morbid, there is always, at the same time, an incomplete and morbid attitude of the ego. And therefore, it could not be scientifically asserted that the cause of the whole thing lies in the defective self, it could just as well be said that it was because the ego had such a wrong attitude that the self cannot come into play positively. If you eat completely wrong and your stomach consequently does not react properly, you can react one of two ways. You can decide that there is something wrong with your stomach and go to numbers of doctors about it without telling them that you are eating wrong, in which case the doctors will conclude that it's very tragic, but you have a defective stomach and it is not possible to find the cause. But, on the other hand, it can just as well be said that if one eats all the wrong things, or does not eat, or eats irregularly, then it is not the stomach which is at fault. Thus the defective self always goes with an ego which does not function properly and therefore naturally the self cannot function properly either. If the ego is lazy, inflated, not conscientious, does not perform the duties of the ego complex, then it is clear that the self cannot appear positively either. If that man were here today, he would certainly object and say, no, it is the other way around. The ego cannot function because the self is defective. There we are confronted with the age-old philosophical problem of free will. Can I want the right thing? That is the problem which the puer eternus man will generally put to you. He will say that he knows that everything goes wrong because he is lazy, but that he cannot w not want to be lazy. That perhaps that is his neurosis, that he is unable to fight his laziness, and therefore it is useless to treat him as a rascal for whom everything would go right if he were not so lazy. That is an argument which I have heard I don't know how many times. It is to a certain extent true, for the puer cannot make up his mind to work, so you can say that it is the defective self, that something is wrong in the whole structure and cannot be saved. This is a problem which comes up in many neuroses, not only in that of the puer eternus. It goes very deep, and my attitude toward it is paradoxical. As long as I can, I behave as if the other could make up his or her mind, because that is the only chance of salvation. If nevertheless the case goes wrong, then I turn around and say that it was not possible for things to have gone differently. Otherwise, one falls into a wrong psychological superiority, 
namely that if a person goes wrong or dies as the result of a disease or an accident, and one concludes that this occurred because he did not realize his problem, that it is his fault, that he has his fate, that I consider disgusting. One has not the right to decide that. Nature has her own revenge. If an individual cannot solve his problems, he generally gets horribly punished with hellish diseases or accidents, and it is not the business of others to point that out and make it a moral issue. There, I think one should stop short and take the other hypothesis, that the person could not do it, that the structure was defective and therefore it was not possible. However, as long as the catastrophe has not taken place, it is better to take the other attitude, to try to create a hopeful atmosphere and believe in the possibility of a certain amount of free will, because empirically there are many cases where suddenly people can make up their minds to fight their neurosis and pull out. Then you can call it a miracle or that person's good deed, whichever you like. But it is also that which in theology is spoken of as an act of grace. Is it your good deeds which lead to salvation or is it the grace of God? In my experience, you can only stay in the contradiction and stick to the paradox. We are confronted with the problem in a specific form here because throughout the story there is this tragic question in our minds. Something is constantly going wrong through the book and one does not know whether it is Saint Exupery's fault or whether he could not help it. Was there some reason from the very beginning which prevented him from solving his problem? A remark from the audience. But Jung says that there is no sickness in the collective unconscious, and so, as the self is an archetype, it does not seem to me that there can be anything defective. Answer. I quite agree. I think that if it appears defective, it is because of the wrong ego attitude. Objectively, in itself, it cannot be defective, which is why I cannot accept the idea of the defective self. If the ego is able to change, something else changes. If the ego attitude changes, then the symbols of the self become more positive. That is something we experience again and again. If the person can achieve a certain amount of insight, then the whole unconscious constellation changes. But my philosophical adversaries would say that the fact that one man can change and the other cannot is due to the self, and then one walks in a circle. In this specific story, I shall therefore try to interpret the child figure in a double way, as the infantile shadow and the self. Then we will try to find out which is which. That means we shall interpret all the material on a double rail and so try to find out more about this problem. The thesis that the star child whom Saint Exupery meets is the infantile shadow can very easily be proved, since he is the only one who understands the story of the boa constrictor and the elephant. That is a remnant of childhood, and we have a letter from Saint Exupery to his mother written in 1935, shortly before his death where he says that the only refreshing source he finds is in certain memories of his childhood, for instance the smell of the Christmas candles. His soul nowadays is completely dried up and is dying of thirst. There is his nostalgia for his childhood, and one can say that the little prince represents this world of childhood, and therefore is the infantile shadow. It is typical that he writes like that to his mother. One really sees that he is still involved in his mother complex. On the other hand, it can be said that the fact that this child appears on earth is not only negative. It is not the apparition of just the infantile shadow, because, as we shall hear later, the little prince comes down from a star. So one can say that an interesting parallel has taken place. Saint Exupery crashed, and from the stars above something else has come down, 
for the little prince comes from a planet. So for the first time two things meet on earth which hitherto were in the air, the star prince who was far away in the cosmos and Saint Exupri who was constantly flying in the air. The moment the little prince lands on the earth, he is not quite the infantile shadow any more because something has touched reality and is therefore now in an ambiguous position. If it could be realized, then it would become a part of the future instead of a pull backwards. It is no longer only an infantile shadow, but a form of realization which goes on all the time. For to become more conscious means, practically, to grow more and more into the reality of things. It means this illusionment. The greatest difficulty we drag along with us from our childhood is the sack of illusions which we carry on our backs into adult life. The subtle problem consists in giving up certain illusions without becoming cynical. There are people who have become disillusioned early in life, you see it if you have to analyze orphans from either very low or very high layers of society, those who are nowadays called neglected children, which means either that they are just poor children who have grown up in slums and had a terrible family life and fate, or very rich children who have had all the same miseries except a lack of money, divorced parents, a bad atmosphere at home, and so on. That is, where the feeling atmosphere has been neglected, which is so important for children. Such people very often grow up quicker than others, because at very early stage they become very realistic and disillusioned and self-contained. The hardships of life have forced them to do this, but you can generally tell from a rather bitter and falsely mature expression that something has gone wrong. They were pushed out of childhood too soon and crashed into reality. If you analyze such people, you find that they have not worked out the problem of childish illusions. They have just cut it off, having assured themselves that their desire for love and their ideals simply hamper them like a sack of stones carried on their backs. So they must all be done away with. But that is an ego decision which does not help at all, and a deeper analysis shows that they are completely caught up in childhood illusions. Their longing for a loving mother or for happiness is still there, but only in a repressed state, so that they are really much less grown up than other people. The problem having simply been pushed into a corner, one then has the horrible task of reviving those illusions because life has stuck there. So the person has to be pushed back into them in order to emerge again properly. That is the problem one meets with in people who say that they can neither love nor trust anybody. For anyone stuck in that situation, life no longer has any meaning. Through the transference, they begin to hope that perhaps they might trust or love again, but you can be sure that the love which first comes up is completely childish, and that the analyzer very often knows what will happen, and that it will just mean disappointment again and be of no use. This is quite true, for such people bring out something so childish that it has to be rebuffed either by the analyst or by life itself. Such people are so immature in their feelings that if, for instance, the analyst is in bed with flu, they experience that as a personal insult and a terrible letdown and disappointment. Quite grown-up people say that they know it to be absolutely unreasonable and idiotic, but that it is how they feel. They ask quite rightly, what does one do if one has such a child? such incorrectable infantilism within oneself. Preaching does no more good than it would do to a small furious child who just does not listen. How can one meet this tremendous problem? If one shelves it as something hampering in life, as a source of illusion and trouble, then one is no longer spontaneous, but disillusioned and grown up in a wrong way. 
But if one lives it, one is just impossible and reality hits one over the head all the time. That is the problem. People who have shelved their feelings or their demands on other people or their capacity for trust always feel not quite real, not quite spontaneous, not quite really themselves. They only feel half alive and they generally also do not take themselves as quite real. To shelve the divine child means not taking oneself completely seriously. One acts. One can adapt throughout life, but if one is honest with oneself, one knows that it is acting. Otherwise, one would behave in such an infantile way that nobody could stand one. So what can one do? That is the problem of the divine child. Theoretically, the situation is clear. One should be able to cut away the childishness and leave the true personality. One should somehow be able to disentangle the two. And if an analysis goes right, that is what slowly happens. One succeeds in disentangling and destroying what is really childish and in saving the creativity and the future life. But, practically, this is something which is immensely subtle and difficult to accomplish. The Divine Child, or Star Prince, whom Saint Exupery meets in the desert, asks for a sheep, and we learn that he has come down to fetch the sheep to take back with him. Later in the story it is said that on the planet there is an overgrowth of baobab trees which are continually sprouting. The star prince wants the sheep to eat the shoots as they appear, so that he does not constantly have to work at cutting them off. But this he does not explain to Saint Exupery, and the real reason only comes later. At first we have to look at the symbolism of the sheep in the personal life of Saint Exupery, and then also in general mythology. In one of his books, Saint Exupery says himself, quote, there is no bad outer fate, only an inner one. There comes a moment when you are vulnerable and your own mistakes seize you and pull you down like a sort of whirlpool. It is not the big obstacles that count so much, but the little ones. Three orange trees on the edge of an airfield, or thirty sheep which you fail to see in the grass and which suddenly emerge between the wheels of your plane. You know that at one time in many places flocks of sheep were used to keep down the grass on the airfields and it could happen that your plane by some mistake ran into them. One could say that he projects onto the sheep the fateful thing which one day kills the puer Aternus, or in this case himself. It is the fatal enemy. The sheep has a very revealing name in Greek. It is called probaton, which comes from the verb to walk forward, so it would mean the walking forward animal. This is a marvelous name. The animal has no other choice and no other function than the capacity to walk forwards. That is all it can do. The Greeks are even more witty, for they make the animal neuter and call it the walking forward thing. That illustrates the most negative aspect of the sheep, which always follows the leading ram wherever it goes. You can read again and again in the papers that if a wolf or a dog chases the leading ram over a precipice, two or three hundred sheep will jump over after him. This happened about ten years ago at Lenzerheide on an Alp when a wolfhound chased the leading ram over the precipice and afterward men had to go with their guns and knives and kill about two hundred sheep. They were not all dead, but they had just piled up one on top of the other. That is why one talks of a person as a silly sheep. The instinct of walking and sticking together in the flock is so strong in them that they cannot pull out even to save their own lives. Those who have seen Walt Disney's film The White Wilderness have seen the same thing with lemmings who wander into the sea. Once caught in such an instinctive move, the animal cannot pull out again. The sheep tends to a similar instinctual behavior and therefore stands, when it appears in a negative connection in dreams, 
for that same thing in us. Mass psychology, our tendency to be infected by mass movements and not stand up for our own judgment and impulses. The sheep is the crowd animal par excellence. Naturally, there is the crowd man in each of us. For instance, you may hear that there are a lot of people at a lecture and you say, then it must be good. Or you hear that someone has an exhibition at the art gallery and you go, but you don't have the courage to say that you think the pictures are horrible. You first look around and see others, who you think ought to know, admiring them, and you daren't express your own opinion. Many people first look at the name of the artist before expressing an opinion. Such people are all considered sheep. The sheep in mythology has a strange relationship to the world of the divine child. You all remember representations of the Madonna, very often together with her own mother, and Christ and St. John the Baptist playing with a lamb, or sometimes there is only Christ and St. John the Baptist playing with a little lamb, or there is the Christ child with a lamb holding a cross and so on. Naturally, the lamb is a representation of Christ himself, but in art is exteriorized as something separate. He himself is the sacrificed lamb, the Agnus Dei, but in art the sheep is shown as the playmate, which naturally means that it is his totem animal, his animal nature. That is what he is when he appears as an animal. In German folklore, there is a belief that the souls of children before they are born live as sheep in the realm of Mother Holly, a kind of earth mother goddess, and those souls of unborn children are identical with the Germans called Lammervolkchen, lamb clouds in English, or fleecy clouds. The peasants thought these little sheep clouds were the souls of innocent children. There was the idea that if on Innocent's Day there were many such clouds in the sky, that predicted the death of many male children. Further, if you look at the traditional beliefs about sheep, you will find that they carry the symbolism of innocence, that they are easily influenced and affected by the evil eye and the witchcraft. They can be bewitched more easily than almost any other animal and they can be killed by the evil eye. A sixth sense is also attributed to the sheep, for by their behavior they are supposed to be able to predict the death of the owner and so on. That to me is not so interesting, because that sort of thing is projected onto many domestic animals. Horses are also supposed to have a sixth sense, as are bees, so that is not something confined to sheep. But to be easily bewitched and persecuted by witches and wolves is specific to sheep in folklore tradition. Milk, another white substance, is also a symbol of innocence and purity, but it can be bewitched at any time. One of the chief activities of wizards and witches in peasant countries is to spoil the neighbor's milk. Therefore, innumerable precautions have to be taken. Milk must not be carried across the street after seven o'clock in the evening. The bucket must be turned around before the cow is milked. Three Ave Marias have to be said, and so on. Our hygienic precautions are nothing compared with the precautions against witchcraft made in earlier times. They were infinitely more complicated, because if a witch even walks past in the street, the milk in the bucket will turn sour or blue at once. If an evil eye is cast onto the cowshed, then the milk will be bluish from then on, and an exorcist must be found. It is interesting that symbols of something especially pure and innocent are particularly exposed to infection or attack by evil. This is because the opposites attract each other, for that is a challenge to the powers of the darkness. In the practical life of the puer Aternus, that is, of the man who has not disentangled himself from the eternal youth archetype, one sees the same thing, a tendency to be believing and naive and idealistic, 
and therefore automatically to attract people who will deceive and cheat such a man. I have often noticed in analyzing men of that kind how they are attracted in a fatal way to rather dubious women or pick friends about whom one who has not a good feeling. It is as though their inexperienced naivety and their wrong kind of idealism automatically call forth the opposite. And it is no use in warning such people against such relationships. You will only be suspected of jealousy or something similar and not be listened to. Such naivete or childish innocence can only be cured of these illusions by passing through disappointment and bad experiences. Warnings are no good. Such men must learn by experience, without which they will never wake up from their innocence. It is as if the wolves, namely crooks and destructive people, instinctively see such lambs as their legal prey. This naturally leads much deeper into the whole problem of our religious tradition. As you know, Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep. This is a paramount image in our religious tradition and one which has created something very destructive, namely, that because Christ is the shepherd and we the sheep, we have been taught by the Church that we should not think or have our own opinions, but just believe. If we cannot believe in the resurrection of the body, such a mystery can no that nobody can understand it, then one must just accept it. Our whole religious tradition has worked in that direction, with the result that if now another system comes, say communism or Nazism, we are taught that we should shut our eyes and not think for ourselves, that we should just believe the Führer or Khrushchev. As long as the leader is a responsible person or the leading ideal is something good, then it is okay. But the drawback of this religious education is now coming out very badly. For Western individuals of the Christian civilization are much more easily infected by mass beliefs than the Eastern. They are predisposed to believe in slogans, having always been told that there are many things they cannot understand and must just believe in order to be saved. So we are trained to be like sheep. That is a terrific shadow of the Christian education for which we are now paying. Saint Exupery's work shows that he was possessed by this idea. He says in the citadel, quote, To build a peace is to build a stable big enough to embrace the whole flock, so that the whole flock can sleep in it. What an idea just to put mankind to sleep! To build a peace is to borrow from God his shepherd's cloak so that all people can be accepted under it, under the divine cloak. End quote. You see, he identifies with God. He is the Godhead who accepts mankind under his cloak, the religious megalomania of the Puer Aeternus. And now comes another complex. Quote, it is just like a mother who loves her sons, and one son is timid and full of tenderness, another burning to live, and another is perhaps a hunchback, another perhaps delicate, but all of them in all their differences move the heart of the mother, and all in the difference of their love serve the glory. In French it is even more sentimental and more impressive, but there you see, how the religious image of the divine shepherd and the sheep is mixed up with the mother complex sentimentality in a very dangerous way. Suddenly, it is the mother who is the shepherd and the children are the sheep. If a wolf comes and eats the shepherd and takes the cloak, then you see what happens to the sheep. It is just the opportunity for a wolf. In the religious situation, the wolf may be the great dictators and leaders we have now or any kind of person who lies and cheats in public life. In private life it is the animus of the devouring mother who takes the lead for the sheep son. And then there are the decent, devoted sons who believe that they have to honor and be chivalrous to their mother, the elderly lady, 
and do not see that the animus of the mother has eaten them and just feeds on their innocence. The devouring animus of the mother feeds on the innocence and the best and most devoted feelings of the son, and there too the sheep have been eaten by the shepherd. So the little star boy in our story wants a sheep, and we learn that it is needed to eat up the over-prolific trees, which are obviously a symbol of the devouring mother. Wanting the sheep seems at first sight to have a positive meaning, since the asteroid is threatened by an overgrowth. As the overgrowth of trees is a mother symbol, the sheep would be something to help fight the mother complex. Now I have just illustrated it the other way around, with the sheep as part of the mother complex, and not as the right remedy against that overgrowth. So here again, it seems to me that we are confronted with complex ambiguity. In what way does the sheep help combat the mother complex? Afterward, we can see how it cooperates. The story says that it bites off the new shoots, which are the overgrowth of the mother complex. But what does that mean psychologically? How much does the crowd man within us help against the mother complex? Answer from the audience. The mother does not seem to be so devouring when he surrenders to her. Marie Louise again. You mean that if the sheep walks into the wolf's mouth, then the wolf gets less dangerous because he is well fed in a way. I don't think that a son who gives in to his mother's devouring desire has ever succeeded in improving matters. That has not been my experience, for the devouring principle generally fattens and grows in every bite it gets. Answer from the audience. I would say that everybody has to get free of the mother. Marie-Louise. Yes, and what can help to free the man from the mother? The audience answers. If a man follows his pattern, namely frees himself from his mother, then he is doing the right thing. Marie-Louise, you mean he hears a psychological saying that everybody has to free himself from the mother? If he does that, he really follows the sheep mentality. He does it because one says so, and by that he frees himself from the mother. That is quite correct. You can say that normally very few young men have a strong enough individuality to pull away from the mother of their own accord. They do it via collectivity. For instance, in our country it is military service which helps young men against their mother complexes. Many are improved or even cured of their attachment to the mother by the military service. It is the sheep mentality, the crowd man, which drives them into military service, but this collective adaptation can be a help to pull away, especially here in Switzerland. In the simple layers of the population, military service still functions to a great extent like the male initiation rituals in primitive tribes. It is the moment to leave the mother. You can say that all kinds of very humble, not individualistic collective adaptations help against the mother complex. As mentioned before, doing one's work, going to military, trying to behave like everybody else, not having that kind of fancied individuality which is typical for the mother complex man and giving up the idea of being somebody special. All that helps against the poison of the mother complex to accept being just somebody or nobody in the crowd is to a certain extent a cure but only a temporary one and not the whole cure. It is only a first step in pulling away from the personal mother. You see, like cures like. How dangerous situations are generally cured by then dangerous situations. To become a crowd man is psychologically a very dangerous thing, but it helps against the danger of the false individuality which one develops within the mother complex. Then one is up against another danger. The medicine used in such a case is dangerous. Therefore, that the star prince wants a sheep could be interpreted positively, for he wants in his ideal divine isolation the company of the crowd soul. 
that would enlarge his asteroid and his world. There are no animals up in his star world, and if he brings one, that is a bit of an earthly instinct which he has brought up there. That seems extremely positive, but you could interpret it negatively also, for it is not a conscious realization, but only pitting one instinct against another. His unconscious is not changed. One instinct just pulls away from another. Which is what is expressed in the story, and I think that from that you can arrive at a definite judgment and say that it is completely negative. Remark from the crowd. The sheep in the box. Marie-Louise. That adds to it. It would say rather that he wants to take the sheep up instead of going down to it. He wants to pull the sheep up into the stars. A sheep is something which walks on the earth. So if, in order to have it, he would stay on the earth, then it would be the thing which pulled him down into reality. In the same way, a man gets pulled down onto the earth if he goes through military service and a lot of other painful adaptations. But if you take the sheep up into the fantasy world of childhood, then it is not an adaption to reality, it is a pseudo-adaption. That is something very subtle, and I think it is specific to Saint Exupery, and not very widespread in other cases. For him, it is a particular danger, but one which you can only judge if you know his generally literary work. There you can see that he did something very strange. However, all that he praises he himself does not stand by, for he assimilates the whole thing intellectually and takes it back into his imaginary world. It is a trick which many pueri attorney perform. The realization that they should adapt to reality is an intellectual idea to them which they fulfill in fantasy but not in reality. The idea is executed only in reflection and on a philosophical level, but not on the level of action. It looks as though they have quite understood, as if they have the right attitude, as if they know what is important and what is right, but they don't do it. If you read Saint Exupery's work, you should attack me and say that he is not a poor Eternus. Look at the sheikh in the citadel, a mature man who would take responsibility on earth. Look at Riviere in Vol de Noir. He is not a poor Eternus, but a man who accepts his responsibilities. He is a grown-up, a masculine man, not a mother-complex fellow. It is all there in his ideas, but Saint Exupery never lived either the sheikh or the Riviere. He fantasized them, and the idea of the down-to-earth grown-up man but he never lived his fantasy. That, I think, is one of the trickiest problems in that specific neurotic constellation, that the puer Aternus always tends to grasp at everything which would be the right thing to do, and then to draw it back into his fantasy theory world. He cannot cross the very simple border from fantasy to action. It is also the dangerous curve in the analysis of such people, for unless the analysis cons constantly watches this problem like an alert fox, the analysis will progress marvelously. The puer Aternus will understand everything, will integrate the shadow and the fact that he has to work and come down to earth. But unless you are like a devil's watchdog behind it, it is all a sham. The whole integration takes place in the sky, not on the earth, not in reality so that it comes down to having to play the governess and ask what time he gets up in the morning, how many hours have been worked in the day, and so on and so on. It is a very tedious job, but that is what it boils down to, because otherwise a fantastic self-deception occurs, which can very easily catch the analyst. We should now consider the sheep in the box. When you assimilate something intellectually, you put it into a box. A concept is a box. When Saint Exupery impatiently puts the sheep in a box, he accepts the idea, but as an idea. It exists, but only in his brain box. 
The little prince thinks the design is as good as real sheep. Everything remains in the world of mental activity. Question from the audience. If Saint Exupery had been cured of his pure Aternus personality, would he have continued to be an artist? Marie-Louise. Being cured of being a puer does not imply being cured of being an artist. If we consider Goethe, we can see that in his early writing there is evidence of a mother complex. He too felt that if he gave up the puer mentality, there would be nothing left. But he pulled through this crisis, and although the puer in his book, The Sorrows of Werther, shot himself, Goethe himself survived. In the really great artist, there is always a puer at first, but it can go further. It is a question of the feeling judgment. If a man ceases to be an artist when he ceases to be a puer, then he was never really an artist. If analysis saves such pseudo-artists from being artists, then thank God. Saint Exupery might have been one of those if he had been in analysis. His, heart, his art is very neurotic. He writes out his neurosis, and it is doubtful that he was a great artist. As such a fuss is made about him, his work might be looked upon as an expression of the neurosis of the present day. But he has displayed the situation in literature, and so beautifully he has raised the question. There is a type of artist who cannot make the switch that Goethe made, and these have to die. One cannot say that they have not been artists, but they did not grow beyond that switchover. In The Sorrows of Werther, Goethe did not deal with the problem of the puer in a final way, and it went on into other works. In the next step, in his drama Turquato Tasso, Goethe represented it as a problem within himself. Simultaneously, by objectifying the puer Tasso and Antonio, the man who wants to live on earth, he detached from the problem. It then became a conflict that goes even further in Faust. One's feeling tells one, when the writer does or does not extricate himself from this problem. Objectifying the puer is only the first step. Question from the audience. Can you qualify the statement that laziness is a characteristic of the Puer Aternus? Goethe and Saint Exupery both worked hard in their lives. Marie Louise. The Puer Aternus has to learn to carry on with his work when he does not want to, not only with the work where he is carried away by great enthusiasm, which is something that everybody can do. Primitive people who are said to be lazy can do that, for as soon as they are gripped by something they work even to the point of exhaustion. I would not evaluate that as work, but as being carried away by a festival of work. The work which is the cure for the puer Aternus is where he has to kick himself out of bed on a dreary morning and again and again take up the boring job, through sheer willpower. Goethe took on a political position and served in Weimar, sitting in his office and reading little requests concerning taxation and so on. This is what he experienced in his work as Antonio, that somehow all belonged in his life. Goethe lived what he wrote. He stayed in his office and gave his mind to the most boring questions, when often he would have preferred to ride off somewhere but somehow he had a deep insight into the necessity of that part of life. Being a feeling type, he thus developed his inferior thinking, which showed very much in the rather boring and unexciting side of his maxims. His conversations with Eckermann are the most disappointing ones. Remark from the audience. Perhaps that throws light on Rousseau's statement that the greatest fault in his character was his laziness. But it is well known that he worked from morning to night and read a great many books. Marie-Louise. Yes, but he must have escaped some other kind of work. People can cheat themselves by working themselves to death in order to do avoid doing the work that they should do. Rousseau had to keep his feet in a tub of water 
in order to get himself to work. He worked in a kind of trance with foot baths. His confessions might have been more to the point and less sentimental without these baths. The audience. To go back to the idea of an author writing out his neurosis, many people are celebrated for that, and such an activity is taken for talent. Marie Louise. I do not think that is mistaken for talent. I think it is something we would all like to be able to do. I would very much like to make money out of my neurotic spots. I think the problem comes after the thing has been written. I think what one writes does concern one's own problem. Otherwise the writing dries up. But when you have written out the problem, or while you are writing it, you have to live it. Whenever I have lectured on a problem, it has always come back on me afterwards. I have observed that with sensation types, it goes the other way round. They live it first and then write about it. When you're writing on a problem, synchronistic events often happen to you at the same time, so that you have to live it concurrently. Jung told me that when he was writing on a special problem, he would get letters from all sorts of places, Australia and elsewhere, which put to him the question he was then writing on. If you touch on an important and vital problem of your own, it generally happens that way, sometimes behind and sometimes ahead of you. That is the difference between only writing of your neurosis or going further. The problem will always tie in with you, and if you live it at the same time, then afterward what you next write will be a step further on. Otherwise, you will again write of the same problem, which is what Saint Exupery did. Such writers always turn on the same gramophone record, whereas if you live it, the next thing will show progress. Goethe lived what he wrote and what he next wrote was always a step further on. The romantic poets repeated themselves much more. They went round in a circle because they did not, or could not, live it at the same time. I do not mean to make accusations, but one should be prepared for what one writes being constellated. So many artists do not want their work to be analyzed because they are afraid that they would have to live it and that is the pseudo-resistance which many of them have against psychoanalysis. For they say that their creativity would be analyzed away. But genuine creativity is so terribly strong that not even the most gifted analyst in the world could wipe it out. This resistance to putting their work to the test is therefore very suspect. End of chapter 2